The Daily Ramble on Claret and Booze. Good morning, happy Friday and welcome to The Daily Ramble here on Claret and Booze. My name's Gary and this is my Daily Ramble, a very rich and varied Daily Ramble today. Uh, going to talk about, uh, firstly, well let's just start where we're going to start and that is a huge two weeks coming up for West Ham. Uh, first of all we've got Wolves at the weekend, um, followed by Leverkusen, Fulham, Leverkusen and Palace. Um, now, usually you'd say Wolves, Fulham and Palace, that'd be three games that we could possibly go and win. Wolves away and Palace away, yeah, you, it depends what West Ham turns up away from home, right? It could be it could be anyone. It could be the one that turned up at Forest recently, for instance, or the one that capitulated at, at, at Newcastle. But anyway, look, assuming if they were normal games, I, I had us down, my prediction for those three games, I did them back in January, so completely, you know, take the emotion out of it. Uh, I had us to lose at Wolves, to win at home to Fulham, and to draw away to Palace. That was my predictions. And so far, my predictions up to this point, I'm three points off, under, where we should be. So if we go and beat Wolves, beat Fulham, that will bring us back level to my predictions. And then if we beat Palace, be ahead of my predictions. And that would be a good sign because that means... I think rather than the 54 points that I predicted, we'd be looking, you know, onwards and upwards and possibly the, the uh, European places start to look like a reality again. Uh, but anyway, five games to absolutely define our season. Uh, Leverkusen, as we know, is superb. They're two two games away, two wins away from uh, securing the German, the Bundesliga title. Absolutely incredible to go a whole season unbeaten. I think he's only drawn about six games, Alonso. So... That's exactly the sort of challenge that our players are going to relish, I believe. Um, we've just got to get through the first leg relatively unscathed. And by relatively unscathed, I mean 1-0, 2-0, 2-1, 3-1, something like that. To leave us within a couple of goals maximum of the target. Um, to bring them back to the London Stadium. Because I do believe at the London Stadium, we do have the cup fans. So it's not all the regular season ticket holders. It's a mass of people uh, and, and and different people who uh, go only to cup games and it tends to be noisier midweek. I think we could beat we could beat them at home. But it all depends on that first leg. And he's running players into the ground at the moment as we see him with uh, Antonio. He's um you know he ain't got many options on the bench but that's his fault he did that. Um, he's got basically a fully fit squad apart from the AWOL Agued. Um and so he designed it like this. This is by design. And so if the lack of players, the lack of strength in depth, comes back to bite him on the arse, it's his fault. Nobody else but his fault. Now, um, it never should have been this tough. Because this reminds me of what happened when we came to the Frankfurt games a few years ago in that we basically ran out of players. And our players ran out of steam. Um Part of me thinks that he's set this up deliberately to give himself an excuse because whatever he thinks will be replicated in the press far and wide. Uh, we'll be told we don't know what we're talking about. Here's what it is. Started me thinking this week, what is that relationship between the, the managers and the press? And I, I actually ended up reading an academic paper which um, traced it back to 1920s. Herbert Chapman, he was like the original Arsenal manager. And um, he created football managers. And he was actually a journalist, and he created this uh, this thing of um, the the relationship, obviously, between journos and, and managers because he is one. Now, back in 1966, the day after um, England won the World Cup final against Germany at Wembley, um, there was a journalist called Ken Jones who approached Alf Ramsey, the victorious manager. So this is the day after that great win, and he he asked him for an interview. Alf Ramsey turned around to him and said, "Sorry, it's my day off." And walked away. He meant it. You know, that is the way it worked back then. They were held, managers, especially England managers, were, were treated as serious figures, deferential figures. And they enjoyed a kind of cordial relationship with the media. But that changed in, in 1969 when, when obviously the, 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 uh, the tabloids came along in terms of, um, uh, what's his name, the Aussie, Rupert Murdoch. He took the sun over in, uh, in 1969 and basically turned it, dumbed it down turned it into uh, a tabloid um it and from that point on it's instead of focusing on 
um, public interest stories, if you like. It's focused on human interest, emotions, all that sort of stuff. So complete dumbing down uh, of stories. And that's where we are today. The press can make or break a manager. And they're, they're absolutely trying to make David Moyes. And I think it all traces back to the relationship between the uh, Football Writers Association, which is the union that all these journos work for. And uh, yeah, none other than Jim White is on that uh, uh, management board. And the League Managers Association. All right. And um, so when three almost, and this has been covered by Gonzo and Nick now, but the three identical articles came out at the same time this week, pretty much. Um, it's definitely come out of Moyes or his agent or a Moyes representative. Um, uh, you know, because we know that he's that he's going to storm out if he's forced to work under a director of football. He, he'll, he'll sulk, he'll feel insulted and hurt because he don't feel like he's getting the respect he deserves because he thinks that, you know, football should be how football was. And, uh, and, and it's never going to be that way again, Dave. So, you know, suck it up or piss off is what it is. Uh, preferably piss off. So, um, and those journos, those journos who put those stories out there, Henry Winter, Jason Burton, one other, they put the stories out there and immediately followed it up with interviews in, on, on, on the media in, in, a, in, in on Sky Sports and on Talk Sport and things like that to get the word out there, right? And basically to have a pop at West Ham fans. Um it's a, it's a sort of unhealthy relationship and codependence between the British members of the League Managers Association and the British press. You know, Moyes is good for a story, right? Uh, but not these newfangled foreigners. They tend to play their cards a bit, little bit more close to their chest. You know, it'd be a nightmare if they didn't have the inside track on West Ham. You know, Jim White has supported Moyes so much on TalkSport. It's like, it's as if they're related. Um, you know, like I said earlier, he's on the management committee of the, of the Writers Association. Now, um, but let's focus on these two prats, these two pricks, Jason Burt and uh, Henry Winter. So Jason Burt of the Telegraph, Man United supporter. He has a vested interest in Moyes and has always supported him. And I'm going to, I'm going to explain why. Back in 2003, Burt wrote a long article in The Independent where he interviewed Moyes' chairman at the time, Bill Kemright. Um, and Kemright was gushing about how great Moyes was, absolutely gushing. In in that same article, Ken Wright spoke of his disregard <coughs> of foreign managers employed for personality over ability. And he cited Gianluca Viali as, as a prime example. It was an expensive mistake by Watford, I think. He pointed out that Moyes is not alone in being successful. There are many other British managers with his approach, such as Ian Dowie, Mickey Adams, Gary Megson and Paul Jewell. I mean, fucking top managers they were. According to Ken Wright, they were all unsung heroes. Um, it was quoted as saying, they're all grateful and they've all paid their dues, i.e. They've, they've worked in the lower leagues. Later in the article, Jason Burt raised um, Adam Crozier, uh, who'd hired Sven Joran Eriksson recently as England manager. So, you know, and he said uh, to the press, we embrace foreign managers. Um, the League Managers Association at that time were apoplectic, right? There was no way should be allowed that a foreigner should manage the English team. So um, the LMA and the FMA and the FWA, so the Writers Association, League Managers Association, then launched a joint project to work together um, to set about ensuring there were more British managers in the future. Uh, they joined with such luminaries as Howard Wilkinson and stuff like that, right? Um, they, joined, uh, they launched a joint course at Warwick Business School to prepare new British managers for, for success. Howard Wilkinson said he wanted a British manager at Barcelona and at, uh, I don't know, Real Madrid. And um, no, nobody, you know, forgive the uh, forgive the, the irony there. Um, the first graduates were Mark Hughes, Brian Laws and Stuart Gray. So it was a huge success. Um, and finally, in this article, uh, Jason Burt delivered his agenda of bias towards British managers. And, and, and more than 20 years, he, he, 20 years later, he still does the same. If you look at his recent, his recent tweets, his recent articles, after every win, and there ain't been many, there have been two league wins this year, he just fluffs up David Moyes. He goes over the top. So we wonder where all this fucking wave of enthusiasm comes from after a win and it all goes quiet after a loss. It's for people like him. It ain't even our own fans. It's people like him. It's people like this prick, right? Um, but he's a Man United fan. When Moyes was the manager of Man United, he was once quoted a senior source at the club who said, and it was after a defeat, the kind of performances that are the DNA of the club in terms of what fans love 
about the way we play football were not there. There was a feeling that Moyes worried too much about stopping the opposition rather than setting up his own team and would talk about them more than his own selection. Now we're just saying the same thing, but we're not allowed to have that opinion, are we, Jason? So on that note, Jason, you are this week's Prick of the Week. But hang on, Henry Winter. Henry Winter, the man who once appeared in court to help find West Ham guilty in the Tevez affair, costing us more than 25 million. Uh, another member of the um, FWA, he likes to consider himself the thinking man's journalist. You know, he's calm, intelligent voice. He's among, you know, in amongst all the rabble, all these people, all these commoners, you know. Um, he was on TalkSport yesterday, um, saying how he felt Moyes would leave at the end of the season and how he was disrespected by West Ham fans and how we would come to regret it and should be heaping praise on him rather than criticism. Um, but, again, like Jason Burt, it wasn't the same when he was at Man U. In 2014, after Man U lost to Olympiakos, Winter wrote, Criticism will rightly froth indignantly towards David Moyes because his tactics were too cautious, says, da says uh, Henry Winter of Daily Telegraph. He failed to give his players the right game plan. But we're not allowed to fucking say that, right? You see the fucking... Uh, the, the hypocrisy here is mind-blowing. Absolutely mind-blowing. Both of them were completely on the side of the Man United fans and Man United, you know, everyone who's dissenting his football style at Man United... These guys were two of the fucking ringleaders. They were out there in front, waving the flag. Get him out, right? But for West Ham, no. It's a little old West Ham. Fuck you, West Ham. Um, the one the one highlight. So, uh, you know, for this week, I think it's got to be joint pricks of the week. Henry Winter and Jason Burke. Congratulations. One little ray of sunshine yesterday, which is unusual for me because it was from the sun. Uh, Charlie Wyatt. He called in to speak with Henry Winter, uh, uh, and he, he didn't really play ball with him. He, 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 he even suggested that West Ham fans might have the right to have their own opinions. So that's very unusual, somebody from the media. Fucking hell, he must have broken out. He's an outlier, right? Um, you know, in other news, Sunderland. Sunderland look like they're going to snap up Divin Mabama, the third player they've signed. Uh, almost definitely going to happen. We've got two other players there. They're doing well. Um, I went to the Spurs game the other night. I was in in 1966 at the Forge Lounge. Uh, spoke with Keenan Potsy uh, for quite a long time, actually. Um, uh, and I think after speaking with them, a few things, I, you know, I wouldn't want to go into depth about what they said. That'd be ridiculous. So uh, let me just let me just put it in the uh, the best way I can. Keen uh, and Potsy both agreed there are five to six absolute top prospects who, according to them and they should know they've been through this path, have the ability and mentality to become Premier League regulars, if not top players. And they need to be given the path through to the first team, and for them, Mark Noble is the one that opens up that path. But Mark Noble needs to be empowered to be able to do that. And um, and so personally, I'm looking forward to Mark Noble getting that power under the new manager. Because if we were to waste this chance and absolutely throw away five or six top prospects, only to see them start blossoming somewhere else, I know what some of you are going to say. Oh, these people, these pe these players, who's ever been a success when they left West Ham? Well, look, you, you know, basically I had that conversation as well. Pretty much is all we've lost so far. They're, they're not top players. These players, according to them, are on a whole nother level, right? So, um, you know, I, I think I, I'd just like to say everything we've said about the youth team, the setup, the frustrations and everything else on this channel without being too harsh and, and all of the relationships with the management, it's true, right? It's true. And so that's just one of my, you know, just a little refresher in case you need it, right? Here we go. Um, there are a few, you know, David Moyes is not just about the negativity and the horrible football, right? 
It's because he wants to be the boss of everything. It's because he sees himself as the the all seeing eye, the uh, the controller of the football club. He should not be the controller of our mighty club, right? Um, he should be, if anything, at most a first team coach working for a director of football. He can't sign players. He's shit at it. He can't. He he he, he can only manage a tiny squad, as we're seeing again now that will probably terminate our ambitions this year, like it did against Frankfurt a couple of years ago. He can only take us so far, right? He's going to leave us needing a massive fucking rebuild because our squad is old. Old. We Anything between 13 and 16 players would need to be removed, replaced by... the. You know, have a look at the squad. Work it out for yourself, honestly. I ain't going to go for it. His management, man management is terrible. He, he, he kicks players out. He kicks players out. Back to signings, by the way. Phillips, apparently completely unfit and doesn't train hard. Yeah. Well, how the fuck is that allowed to happen? Everyone else trains hard. Youth talent completely ignored. You know, even the ones on the bench don't even train with the first team. Do you know that? Right. He's not a nice man. So I don't feel sorry for him, let alone love him. I think he's a prick. He's openly hostile to anybody that dares question the wisdom of of David Moyes. He doesn't recognise criticism, especially from women. Oh, a couple of journos recently, the women have asked him tough questions. You see on his face, he wants to just say, well, he's dedicated this entire season to his own personal calls. His vendetta against Stuyton. Everything else has fallen by the wayside. We got to the quarterfinal of the League Cup, to him, that was mission accomplished. He was happy to see us get knocked out. He threw the game away, right? If we could finish in Europe, don't matter where, just finish in Europe, that'd be enough for him to put that on his CV as well. We're already in the quarterfinals of, of, of Europe. I think that is because he sees quarterfinals as an achievement. Personally, I don't. I don't see semifinals as an achievement. I see finals as an achievement. You know, if you get to a final and you lose it, it's, that's like... Luck of the draw, isn't it? But semi-finals and quarter-finals? No, you've failed. Right? So David Moyes, look, he doesn't care about the club or its fans. He only cares about David Moyes. He despises us for not, not praying at his, his, his feet. You know, and, and, and really, a player, you know, a man that's selfish should not be in charge of a football club. You know, and he won't stop with this bullshit and working with his mates in the media until he's gone. Until maybe he finds another job managing Crystal Palace or someone like that, right? Uh, but the second, if he's out of work, right, and he doesn't find another job, which I think would be the case, the only fucking club that's going to have him is like a relegation-threatened club like maybe a Burnley, right? As soon as the new manager loses a couple of games in a row, Bert, Winter, and all these, all their fucking mates are going to be flooding the media, probably on his command, suggesting that he comes back in the same way that yesterday Sam Allardyce was being floated as a potential return, right? And Pardew. Strange, eh? But, you know, as Sunderland fans might say, <laughs> if, um, you know, if Crystal Palace or Burnley, well, especially if anyone hires him for the long term, right, to actually do anything other than a recovery job, and it's questionable as to whether he can do that recovery job without a great squad, or big and or big money to spend. He didn't do it at Sunderland, right? So, you know, anybody pinning their hopes on David Moyes to uh, to make a, a a grand recovery for him, you know, on a shoestring budget, I wouldn't fucking get your hopes up. You know, um, don't forget how much money he's had to spend and how much money he's wasted at this club and how many full starts. So, as Sunderland fans might say to you, be careful what you wish for. Right, I hope you enjoyed this show. If you did, please give it a like. Hit the bell notification icon and uh, subscribe to the channel. That should be the other way around. Subscribe to the channel and hit the bell notification icon. Uh, please become a member if you want to uh, access the member features that we've set up in the community. Watch Nick's video from last night to see, um, you know, he did a kind of showcase to show you what all that's about. It's brilliant. The support network that we've got, the community is absolutely fantastic working wonders at the moment and um so glad we went down that route really really good thing to do um it's good to give something back isn't it um yeah until next time that is me done see you soon and in this 
amazingly hard, critical two weeks to our season. Come on, you irons. <laughs> <laughs>